Welcome to Casual Friday. So first I wanna share a finished object with you. So I have my a finished sweater. It's called the Stripes Gone Crazy. And I finally got the sleeves done and got the buttons sewed on to this. I just love this, the sweater. It starts, the body was knit in one piece, so the, the thin stripes start on one side of the cardigan, and then short rows are worked that cause the stripes to get wider and head down toward the bottom of the hem. And then some of the stripes, as they get wide, are just completed around the other side of the front. This worked really well with this uh, gradient pack that had five colors in it because that's how many stripes were on the front of the cardigan, or the front of the cardigan. Um, and then I just had a main color that I used for the background. I'm not sure exactly how much of the gradient packs I used. I had two gradient packs. And I used one of them to knit the, the body. And then I put this away for a year. And when I took it out, I had the other gradient pack. But I don't know what happened to the leftovers of the first one. So I knew I was going to need more than one gradient pack. But I don't know how much I actually ended up using. I used about half of it for um, the sleeves. Half of the second pack for the sleeves. Um, so I just, I, I, I don't know, but um, I, I did a, the, I got help with the buttons. I picked the buttons out last year. There weren't enough of any one color to do all because it has 10 buttons. So I got three different colors and we arranged them in a way that's not perfectly symmetrical because it's three colors and 10 buttons, but I think it worked out well and I'm really happy with it. I was wearing this sweater earlier this week in the morning. So I had my windows to my office open. It was a little chilly. So I'd put it on. All the ends were still hanging. There was no um, button band on it. The button, no, there was a button band, but no button hole band and the buttons hadn't been sewn on. But I would just put it on in the morning. It was perfect for that. But the weather abruptly changed here from like 60s and 70s, low 70s to 92. And we get some 90 degree temperatures here in Minnesota in the summers, but usually not till the end of July, early August. I had ice in my background in my backyard on April 30th, the lakes near me, they didn't have ice out till May 1st. So it's such an abrupt change. <laughs> I'm, I'm sweating um, quite a bit now. Uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a hot weekend. So I want to talk a little bit about my progress learning to spin. I, I know quite a bit about how I learn and what I need to learn, but it's still very interesting to, to note what the challenges are for me learning to spin compared to say when I taught myself to knit 30 years ago. And then to put that in perspective with, uh, when I, le I learned to weave years and years ago, uh, I only did one project and it was interesting. I learned how to do it and then I wasn't, and I'm like, okay, I'm done with it. Um, so how the, the circumstances around learning to knit, learning to weave and learning to spin are quite different. And it's really given me some perspective on my students who I have taught to knit uh, in the past and uh, and I'm not sure how to solve my problems or the challenges that I'm encountering when I'm learning to spin. I'm just sort of cataloging all of it and making note of it and um, and I think it'll make me a better teacher in the future. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever teach anyone to spin, but I think it'll make me a better knitting teacher in the future. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what I need, like what, how, how I process information in order to learn, and then how that worked with learning to uh, knit, learning to weave, and, and, and learning to spin. So I need in order to learn, you have to build some sort of initial foundation. 
at least that's how it works with me. I have to have, I have to, in a, in a brand new situation, I have to lock on to some, something, and then I build from there. It's sort of like, um, it's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle where you, 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 you can see the picture on the front, you open the box and what's inside are all of it's this just jumble of pieces and some are right side up, some are upside down. And the way I put together a jigsaw puzzle, not everybody is this way, is I sort through all the pieces. You know, I have the two, I dump all the pieces out. I have the two lids and Anything that isn't an edge piece, I put into one of the boxes, and anything that is an edge piece, I put into another box. And then once I've done that, I, I put all of the pieces that are not edge pieces to the side, and then I sort through all of the edge pieces. I turn them all right side up, I find the corners, and I see if I can establish where the corners go based on the picture on the front of the box. And and then I look for color clues, whatever, and I, and I start putting things together in that way. And sometimes I have little groups of things that are put together and they're not connected to each other yet, but eventually I connect those. And then I have this foundation, I have this, this framework, and then I can take all of the other puzzle pieces out and I can dump them out. And if, if I'm working with somebody else, some, somebody say, I'm going to work on the sky and I'm going to work on the barn and I'm going to work on, you know, the flowers or something. And so we're separating pieces out and we're looking at our particular um, aspects and we're only focusing on like the barn or only on the sky or only on the flowers. And we can concentrate on that and we, we get those together and then we hook them into the framework. So for me, that's what what learning is like. I have to have something that I can attach all the new information to. If I just have separate pieces of information, they don't have context or meaning for me. And so I am not like a sequential learner necessarily where I learn this and then I learn that and then I learn the next thing and then I learn the next thing after that. I'm not a sequential person. Um, but I do need to start somewhere. And, and then I can say, oh, with, within the context of this, that's how this piece fits in, that's how this piece fits in. And once I have that foundation, often I can take in new information in a wide variety of ways. I can read about it, I can look at pictures, I can watch a video, or someone can tell me information um, that I that can then attach to this foundation. But when I'm, when I'm getting auditory information, I don't process it as auditory. Like I don't play it back in my head that way necessarily. Um, I have to process it visually. So if someone gives me their phone number, they have to give it to me slowly enough so that I can write it down in my head. Like I have like a blackboard in my head and I write it down. I, I hear it and I, as I'm hearing it, I'm writing it down and then later, when I need to use the phone number, I just read it. I just read it. So, um, and that's the same way like with names. If I, if I meet somebody and they tell me their name is Chris, if I visualize the word Chris, if I take, if I, if I actually take the time to do that, then I can read their name tag in my head later and I'll know who they are. If they're introduced to 10 people at once or like, oh, this is Chris, oh, hi, and we start talking, I don't process the name visually, I'll forget the name. Now I can sit and listen to a lecture uh, that's in sort of story form about uh, something that's new information to me and I can process uh, information like that visually because it's like I am visualizing what they're talking about and so often I can repeat it all back to somebody else. Um, but when it's information about a skill or or something that isn't really told in story form like that, then I have um, uh, a harder time processing. And I, I will have difficulty processing like a technical manual also because I can't build a visual system for it. Um, so if, but you know, if I have experience with, with something and then I can attach that information. So it's all about attaching and building this framework in my, in my brain. So the challenge with learning to spin or any other type of skill is what 
what are, what are the key things that I need to know and to have so that I can build on that? Well, when I learned to knit, I had a goal. I wanted to, my, my flatmate was knitting a sweater for the summertime and I thought, oh, I, you know, I'd love to learn to knit. I'm, I'm going to make a top as well. And I went down to the department store and in those days, when you got patterns, you bought patterns in hard copy form. And if you were at a yarn shop, the yarn shop would carry, you know, different brands of yarn and they would also carry patterns written by those yarn companies because they wanted to sell the yarn. So they would develop patterns for their yarns. So you'd go to the yarn shop, you'd find a pattern that you liked. And if it was a pattern from a yarn company, it wasn't like a, a, a book of patterns from like a designer who oftentimes were associated with a yarn company, incidentally. Um, you find the pattern and then the shop would carry that yarn. So you could get that specific yarn often in that specific color if that's what you wanted. And that's what happened with me when I bought my first knitting pattern is they were all on separate cards. I found, I found a simple top, sleeveless top. I found it. They had that yarn. They had the exact materials I needed to make this project. And then I saw what size needles I needed and I bought those. So I had the exact materials and tools that I needed in order to create this particular uh, item. So then I just needed to learn the, the specific techniques that the pattern was calling for. I needed to learn to cast on. So my room, my flatmates helped me cast on. I had some familiarity with the knit stitch. I was doing it wrong, so they helped me with that. And then I had to learn the purl stitch all on my own. And I was able to do that by studying the photos and, and books and, and, then, and then trying it. It's a physical skill. So I can't learn a physical skill just by watching somebody else do it. I, I need to have that information, either written instructions or visual instructions, um, or someone standing there telling me what to do as I'm doing it. Although I find that much more difficult because I like to be able to see ahead. But then I need to practice the skill. So I know that it's a physical skill. You can't just learn by, you learn visually. People who say they're visual learners and they need to see somebody else doing, doing that. Uh, I think it's possible that some people genuinely need that. I think uh, what a lot of people don't understand is that as long as they can read instructions and comprehend the words, that the visual information that they need can be in their very own hands. Um, the problem that they're having when they're reading the, just reading the text is they can't visualize something that they've never seen before. And the mistake that they often are making uh, is that they need to see somebody else do it. And that's not, that's not always the case. So I was able to build on knitting in this particular way. When I started teaching knitting, uh, I, my assumption was that people would want to learn to knit. They would have something in mind that they wanted to knit and that, uh, they were just learning, taking a class so that they could learn the techniques and then apply it to whatever thing that it was that they wanted to knit. But I've discovered that that wasn't the case. Some people said, oh, well, a lot of people were, I'm pregnant with my first child, so I want to learn to knit and they want to make some things for the baby. Or um, I'm going to be a new grandma and I want to learn to knit. Some people just thought, oh, it'd be interesting to learn to knit. They had no idea what they wanted to make because they, they didn't know what they could make. So they wanted me to tell them what to make. Or they expected that when they showed up for the class, they would say, well, so what are we going to make? And so we're not making anything. You're learning to knit. <laughs> what would you like to make? And I don't know. So, so that, that was a difficult, um, realization to kind of process that. First of all, I didn't take a knitting class. And so, so that I began to assume, oh, well, people are taking knitting classes. They're not, they're not, motivated or don't learn in the same way so that they're, they're not the same people as as I am and most teachers were, were people who did learn to knit on their own so we all the other teachers that I would talk about we we often were puzzled by this how do they not know what they want to to knit or so that that was something we were, we were often puzzling through but eventually uh, I came up with a project so I came up with this uh 
really easy fingerless mitt patterns, basically uh, a rectangle that has garter stitch borders and stockinette in the middle so that they would learn to, they start with just garter stitch and then they would learn to switch from knits. So, uh, and then on the right side rows, it's all knits all the way across. And then on the wrong side rows, you would knit the garter stitch borders, but then you would switch to pearls. So you were only switching between knits and pearls twice a row. So you didn't have to do anything like ribbing where you were constantly switching and then making mistakes. Um, so it was just a little square and taught them to read a pattern. So it, it really ended up being a nice teaching tool. And I was like, There's, you don't have to finish this. You know, it's something to work on in the class. Uh, you don't have to finish it. Uh, you could finish one of them and then decide what you wanted to knit. So that, that tended to work really well, just having something uh, small for them to to feel like they're working on. So I learned something from that. The problem I'm having with spinning is that my goal is to understand different wool breeds. Like that was my initial goal. I want to use different, I want to try out different yarns and they were made from different wool breeds and, and see how they compare and see what the advantages are and, and just, just to explore that. And so that was my goal. And so the switch to saying, oh, I need to learn to spin came from the realization that ready-made yarns were not readily available here. Now I've gotten a few comments from people telling me, oh, in the UK we have all these different, you know, they, they're giving me mail order places um, to try different uh, yarns from different yarn breeders. So I've been looking at those uh, websites, but so my decision to spin came out of this understanding that I wasn't going to be able to buy the yarns from these different breeds, that I was going to need to experience these wools by spinning them myself. So I don't have any specific goal like, oh, I want to learn to spin a worsted weight three ply uh, wool. And maybe I do need that goal. Maybe that needs to be my goal. But it's my goal is just to learn to spin. Okay, I'm going to learn to spin on the spinning wheel. In the meantime, I'm going to learn to spin on the spindle just to get a handle, a hang of some of the, of the the terms and the tools and the process, like the some of the building, some of the muscle memory for um, what they call drafting um, the wool. Um, so separating, you know, st stretching the fibers out. Like if you have some, you know, wool like this and you want to spin it, um, then you need to kind of pull the fibers that you, you have a, you know, smaller number of them and then this is called drafting. Well, right now I'm doing what's called pre-drafting, I guess. And um, then when you're actually spinning and you're applying twist to this, that's what uh, forms the yarn. It's, it's having these fibers all twisted together that forms it into yarn. So, um, so I don't have this specific goal, which means that the tools and materials I need, I don't know what the tools and materials I need. I'm like, oh, a spinning wheel. So I go look, I want, oh, I'm going to learn the parts of a spinning wheel. Well, every, there's certain commonalities amongst these spinning wheels, but then there's different styles of spinning wheels. There's what they call the Saxon or Saxony, Saxony, which is the one you think of, like if you think of a, like a, painting or a storybook from the olden days where they have the big wheel off to one side and everything it's sort of more more horizontal it takes up more space not quite it's not very portable um, then they have the castle style where you have um, the wheel is kind of on the bottom and then the the bobbins the things that are accumulating the yarn is on top so it's it's more of a vertical style and then they have these modern styles people are always coming up with other ways I think there's a third, I don't remember. Um, so they have these different things and a lot of them have similar parts. But, you know, I, so I don't know what kind of spinning wheel I'm going to be learning on. I assume they have double drive and single drive. And then with single drive, they have Irish tension and Scotch tension. And I, so I'm, I'm like finding all the stuff. I'm getting overwhelmed by the information because I don't know what I need to know. And I'm, I, so I'm getting all this information, like getting the entire box, a uh, jigsaw puzzle and saying, put this together, but I don't have that process. I don't know about the edge pieces yet. And I don't know, you know, I don't have any idea about, about how to do that. So I have this box of 
puzzle pieces and I don't know what the edge pieces are or the corner pieces and um, it's just it's too much information a lot of things that I don't need but but I'm the one who's sorting it out I'm not being directed by um, here it here is the exact type of, of wool that you need to start spinning with so for example uh, when I bought this um, two ounces of this this wool here I think she called it roving I always thought this was called roving and um, and you know that's I thought that's what that was called and I had heard the terms top and I'd heard the terms bat and then and then I start reading a book and then they're bringing up other words like rolag and I'm like oh, I don't want to know these other words and uh, so it turns out that what I this is not roving this is top and the way th that you know the difference is because the fibers are all parallel to each other only they're kind of not because this has been dyed and so it's been that kind of can take a little bit of the parallel strand nature out of this and then and you know so I'm trying so I realize that these are parallel and this is how I have to pull them out but then I'm like oh, it's so hard it's so hard I didn't know about you know oh well you're supposed to you know separate this thing out or f fluff it up a little bit to spread it out so that it's wider and then you can st take strips off you know there's so many things I don't know and there's so many things that were, I, like I said, I didn't know that there was a difference. I thought this was called roving, and a lot of people use that as a generic term, but roving is, is more specific, and where the, the strands are not parallel to each other. So this is called, I believe this is called top, you know? And so then I'm like, well, I need to get a drop spindle. Then I discover that there's two different kinds, and then I actually discover that even within the, the type that I got, which is a top whorl spindle that a lot of them have a slit. So when I'm looking for information about how to get started on the spindle, I'm noticing that, that they're showing with this slit and I don't have the slit and does that make a difference? I don't know. So then I have to go back and look for more information and I'm getting a lot more things that, that, that are irrelevant to me. So, you know, I think when I take the spinning wheel class that it will probably be a little more directed. Like I'll, I'll here, here's the, here are the tools you're going to use this spinning wheel. Let me tell you all the parts of the spinning wheel. I'm hoping that that's what it's going to be. So, you know, last weekend I was, you know, going through, you know, I, I would spin and then I would, I would say, okay, this, this thing happened that was wrong. How do I, what did I do wrong? So I go back and try to find some videos that would, you know, more videos that I could go back over and see what I did. Oh, I did this wrong. It untwisted because of this. And here's a technique that I can use to prevent that. And so then the next time I spin and it works better. And then I realize, well, what do I do? This, this is called a cop. This, the spun yarn that's on there. Like, what do I do? Because I thought, oh, each time I spin, when I get ready, the next time I'll just take it off. And I thought, well, how do you take it off? Like, you know, it's just on this, it's just wound around this um, spindle. So how do I get it off of the spindle? And what do I, <laughs> what do I do? Because then, you know, you're 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 spinning a ply, and then later sometimes you want to ply them together. So I'm like, so I have to go look up, like, how do you take this off? So then I find out, oh, well, they put them on a bobbin or they do this or they do that. There's a million different ways they, they might do that. Then I start finding out there's a thing called a nitty knotty. And I'd heard of this before, like years ago. I didn't know the name. People were talking about nostopinas and nitty knotty. I didn't know what those were. And there weren't anything that I ever used or thought I needed. And um, so last so I found out what a nose to pin is and my brother's a woodworker. So I had him make me one and uh, he gave it to me last September and I was really happy. And I, I, I usually use it when I'm have a ball that I need to rewind a small ball. Um, but it's really nice just to have those old fashioned tools. I really, I really like that. Um, so this, uh, this past week when I found out, well, you know, to take things off of the cop, then a lot of times they use this nitty knotty, which is this, it's a, it's a, basically it's a stick, you know, how it could be like a foot long or two feet long. It's a stick. And then there are sticks that are parallel to it. So like you have, so here's the stick and then you have another stick that's parallel to it like this. 
And on the bottom, on the other end, you have another, another um, perpendicular stick. But then those, those two perpendicular sticks are rotated so that they're perpendicular to each other. They're all on different planes. And then you hold on to this center stick and you can wind wind things off in this nitty knotty. And I thought, oh, that's going to be, that's a, a, a fun thing to have. And um, so I sent a picture of one to my brother and I said, oh, here's something you can make for me because I'm keeping him in socks so he can make things for me. And um, so he was off camping this past weekend and, he, and he, he's, he's up in um, the Traverse City area or was he in the Traverse? Yeah, Traverse City area. So Michigan looks like a mitten and Traverse City is up, up here. And um, he said, oh, there's this um, fiber festival that's going on here. And I, and up in, up in Traverse City, we're going to, we're going to stop by it. And I said, oh, I bet there's a shepherd's wool. There's a, I said, there's a wool company called Shepherd's Wool. I think it's a mother daughter. Um, and they have a mill, like they, they mill their, the, they have a, a, a wool mill and then they make their own yarn. And then they also go around the world, around the country, teaching people how to set up their own mills so they can do that. And, um, I said, I think they're from somewhere around there. And he said, um, and I said, is it Tip of the Mitt? Is that where you are? Tip of the Mitt Fiber Festival? He said, yeah. And I said, well, they're called Shepherd's Wool. So they have really nice yarn. I, um, it comes in four ounce hanks instead of 100 gram hanks. So it's three and a half ounces. And it's four ounces instead of three and a half ounces. And I was able to make two hats from one hank of their yarn because there was just enough extra yardage. So he ended up stopping by their booth. And he said, well, is there anything you want? Like, I'm learning to spin my own wool. I don't need you to buy me yarn. I said, but if you see a color you like, I have a hat pattern. I'll make you a hat. Well, then he shows me a book and he said, oh, do you need this book? And I, and it's something like a hundred, a hundred breeds of wool and like from fleece to yarn. I don't know, something, something like that. But it's by these women. I, I saw, I know, I recognize the names of the, the women's names who wrote it. It's Deborah Robson and Carol Acarius. And I said, oh, I think I just ordered that book. It's coming. Amazon's delivering it tomorrow. And I went and I looked. I said, no, no, I ordered this one. So I ordered this book. It's called Fleece and Fiber Source Book. So it's got a lot of sheep wool in here, but it's got all kinds of different um, animals too, like llamas and alpacas and, and like if you pet yarn, like which types of dog breeds have yarn or you know, fur, that hair that's good for um, spinning into yarn. And so it's really, it's really interesting. Um, I haven't d dived into it too thoroughly yet, but it's really fun to look at how different, uh, different breeds of sheep look. They, they just, some of them are just crazy. They have crazy horns and some of them have curly horns and some don't have any horns at all. And um, so it's an interesting book. So he said, well, do you want me to buy it? And <laughs> I grew up in a family of readers and so we had this rule where when you buy somebody a book you get to read it first before you give it to them. So he, my brother's you know he's an information seeker too he's he's in from, you know interested in things. I said well if you want to read it I said I can order it myself. I said but if you want to read it go ahead and buy it and then you can give it to me. <laughs> okay I'm gonna get it. So um so I don't know if he bought me any yarn or not. I think he bought the book and I'm hoping he's going to make me a nitty knotty. So the other thing that, you know, I was discovering about, about spinning was that you have to let the twist set. And I didn't know how long you had to do that. And then I didn't know, like, well, how do you wind it up? And so I decided because I'm, you know, this is not, I'm learning to spin. I'm not making anything out of this yarn. Like my, my first day of spinning everything unspun so I have all these different you know things that the <laughs> pieces left and then my second time spinning um is very thick and thin but I didn't break that it didn't break at all and so I was able to and it just sat it sat on my spindle for a few days and I'm like well I'm not I don't have a nitty naughty there's not enough of it to do that I'm not and I I want to keep it all separate because I want to kind of 
here's my first day, here's my second day, here's my third, you know, just so I can see how I progressed. So I just slid it off the spindle and held it there. And then yesterday, uh, yesterday I was spinning and things were kind of, there was, I got to a point where I felt like, oh, the, the process of drawing out, um, the wool and then letting the twist come up it there there's just this you know hand coordination i was finally getting the hang of of what to do and it seemed like it was working there were some places where um i got like it got really hard to pull the wool out, to, to pull the wool and I, it got very thick and then i did remember reading something or seeing something about that like why that was going on so i i understood what i did wrong um and I, but I don't care. And then at some point, you know, I was going, I'm like, oh, it's coming out. It's like coming apart. And, and it, it fell. And I realized all of a sudden I'd st I had st switched from spinning clockwise of spinning counterclockwise. And I think I had locked in the thread well enough that it wasn't affecting what was already wound up. But at some point, I think I then I went from doing counterclockwise back to clockwise and then it just all unspun and and fell apart. So I have to so that reminds me I have to come up with a way some kind of process that I can develop into muscle memory of making sure that I'm always spinning it in the correct way. I read something about people like they they slide it along their leg and I'm like oh if you do that to get it to go spinning like if you pull from your knee toward your hip on your right leg that would make it go clockwise. So I might use that as a way to, you know, remind me. But, you know, this just developing this muscle memory. Um, so then I can focus on other techniques. And it's just more of a challenge because, because of the... Um, of the amount of information I had. But what's what's interesting is that when I learned to knit, you know, I had that initial specific goal and then I built on my skills from there for about a year or maybe two years where I'm like, I could see what I wanted. Oh, I wanted to do cables. I wanted to do lace. I wanted to do strand of color work or I wanted to do intarsia and I could learn the techniques for doing that. But what I didn't know what I wasn't aware of is that patterns sometimes imply that you're supposed to be doing um, mirroring decreases or mirroring increases, and they're not telling you that. They're just telling you to decrease at each end of each, decrease at each end of the row, every other row, or something like that. And I would interpret that as decrease the very first two stitches, very last two stitches, and just using it two together. If they gave me specific instructions to place an SSK in this location, at this place, and uh, knit two together in another place, uh, I could do that, but I didn't understand why I was doing I didn't understand what, I was just doing what I was told, and I didn't know why. So that ended up, and because I had no exposure, to any other knitters and I only had the book that I had this knit kit that I had up on my uh, wall somewhere um, I assumed that I knew what I was doing I felt competent and I could get through I could I could complete a sweater and it usually looked pretty good sometimes things would look a little funnier and I didn't I didn't know why and I knew I had limitations but I didn't, I, I didn't know specifically what those limitations were. And I did, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And it was that isolation that, um, and some assumptions I made about uh, what reference books were for. I know how to knit. Why do I need a reference book? And the fact that off anyway, that reference books also don't tell you why you might need something. They just tell you how to do it. So... So that's, you know, that's a tricky thing when you're isolated and the reference books aren't telling you why, they're just telling you how. Um, that's tricky. So it wasn't until I came back to knitting, uh, I met other knitters in real life, I met knitters on the internet, I had the Master in Hand Knitting program, that all of a sudden uh, the door opened, here's what, here's what it is you didn't know. Now go learn it. And, and that made a huge difference. So 
The problem I'm having right now with spinning is that I have access to every book. <laughs> I can just go on Amazon, order a book. Uh, I have access to a huge library of, of spinning videos, but I don't know which ones are good or which ones are bad and which ones have the information I need. And then I have access to, you know, to Ravelry and all that. Like the other day I was reading some thread on Ravelry. I don't even know what it was about. And the woman was talking about something that happened in a particular group that she participates in, like doesn't have any of the buttons, like the interesting, like, love, you know, dislike, whatever. It doesn't have any of those buttons. And she, she didn't know why that was. And, um, I thought, oh, I wonder what group that is. It was just curious. And... Snoopy. So I went and looked at her pri profile and she, she's a member of so many different groups. So I was just scrolling down her groups and I saw a group that was called Rolag something, Rolag roll up or roll, I don't know, something. That is not a word I knew a week ago. And so if a week ago, if I'd gone through those groups, I wouldn't have even uh, noticed. Uh, I, w I wouldn't, I would have seen a word I didn't know and just gone by. But I heard that word, I knew it had to do with spinning. So I clicked on that group just to see what it was. And then I see this amazing picture. <laughs> it has to do with spinning. It has to do with how you're preparing the wool in a certain way to spin, which I don't know. Like, and I'm looking at all these photos and I'm like, I don't need to know this. <laughs> and but it, what it's doing is it's it's opening all of these doors and showing me all of the things that are out there and it's it's overwhelming and I'm realizing how much there is to learn or could be learned about spinning and um, what a rabbit hole this is. So, but I'm not I'm not going to give up. I think uh, I think it's just pushing past this stage of being overwhelmed. And um, being careful about um, how how many videos, how many websites, how many books I look at, that it's just balancing that, not just spending all my time taking in information and not doing spending any of the time doing the work. Because the thing that's up, that's discouraging also about starting a new physical skill is that I know I'm bad at it. I know I'm going to be bad at it and I know I'm not going to get good at it until I practice it. But I don't want to practice it. I just want to be good at it. I want to do it. And um, so there's sort of that forcing myself to practice uh, at least every couple of days. Uh, just so that I, whatever I've learned before, I can continue improving on and then learning from the mistakes, remembering what the mistake I was and, and thinking about how, how to prevent myself from making that mistake, like spinning this the wrong way. But in the meantime, I'm discovering also that there aren't just two types of spindles, top whirl and bottom whirl. And it isn't just that the top whirl, some have a slot and some of them don't. There's also these supported spindles. There's these, it's just like, <laughs> like la, 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 la. But at the same time, I'm fascinated by it. And I also, I think just by watching all of these different kinds of spindles, sometimes there's certain things that are, um, the same in every situation, which is, you know, preparing your wool and, and, and what you have to do in order to get the, the wool to spin into, into a ply, a single ply. So I can still learn from those, but it, it is a lot of filtering out. Um, but it's interesting and it's fun. And I'm really glad that I am starting on this adventure. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Oh! <laughs>